Well, a very big welcome to everyone for the first Travel Tuesday lecture for 2024. Seems hard to believe that this program of free lectures started only a year ago. Uh, and of course, if you do wish to see any of the lectures that were given last year, they are all there on the ASA website. So I know you have some real treats amongst the great range of lectures that Travel Tuesdays offered last year. And I know that tonight will be a real treat for everybody who is attending. David Henderson is a wonderful artist and somebody who talks about art and teaches art quite brilliantly. David is also very well qualified to talk about architecture because he himself studied architecture for several years in Brisbane before going off to the London Royal Academy schools and of course then developing his own very distinguished career as an artist. So David is an award-winning artist. He's held over 30 solo exhibitions in various places around the world. He's a fellow of the Royal Queensland Art Society. And of course, he is an ASA tour leader. So David and I are going to be taking a tour group to northern France in June of this year. And I believe there are still one or two rooms available on that tour. So David will be talking about the Impressionists and some of the wonderful art that we see on the tour. And I will be covering the literary side of the tour with all of those great writers like Proust and Balzac and Rimbaud and Flaubert and so many others. So that's a tour in June of this year. Then in October of this year, uh, David will be coming with me to Sicily. We'll be following in the footsteps of Lampedusa, who wrote The Leopard, Inspector Montalbano, and so many wonderful visiting authors who went to Sicily. So that's going to be in uh, late September, early October of this year. But David also has a fabulous sounding tour in September, October of next year. That's going to be in Venice. And that will be followed by another tour that he is doing in Sicily in October 2025. So I can strongly recommend David's tours. You just learn so much from him. And uh, I know that all of those tours are going to be absolutely wonderful. But tonight, David is going to talk to us about Veronese, Palladio, and the Villa Barbaro, which he tells me is very close to Venice. So, David, I would like to welcome you, and I know that we're all in for a very big treat with your lecture. Oh, that, thank you so much, Susanna. And um, I, too, looking ver forward very much to our tours later this year. So, welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak this evening about a subject which is very dear to my heart. It's it's really, I think, my favourite visit on the ASA Venice tour. And I want to speak a little bit about the people who created this marvellous building. It's really interesting because it's such a, such a wonderful collaboration of a number of really quite brilliant minds, the Villa Barbaro. So the Villa Barbaro is one of the famous villas of the Veneto, it's located some 70 or so kilometres to the north of Venice, and it features wonderful fresco paintings by Paolo Veronese, one of the leading painters of the day, uh, and it's built to a design by Andrea Palladio. I, I said in my blurb that he was one of the most influential architects in history, and I'm not sure if I shouldn't call him the most influential architect in history. Uh, he's really um, a, a figure of, of, of great importance indeed. So, so by way of introducing the, the villa, I want to speak a little bit about the, uh, the fascinating iconography of the frescoes in the villa, as well as the design of the villa. It's, it's really a, a kind of a vast subject, and I'm probably only going to be scratching the surface of it, actually. Before I do that, I'd like to introduce to you some of our protagonists, some of the main protagonists of the story. So first of all, Palladio, Andrea Palladio. He was born in uh, 1508. He was called Andrea di Pietro. And... He's unlike the uh, other major architects of the Renaissance Baroque period in Italy. He's not coming out of uh, painting or sculpture like Mike Michelangelo or Pietro da Cortona or one of these people. He's really coming out of it from the practical side. He was uh, trained as a stonemason initially and, and came into architecture a little bit later in life. And here he is on the frontispiece of uh, his most famous published work, The Four Books of Architecture. And th this is basically just a sort of a, um, a summary 
of all of the buildings that he made and some of his thoughts about architecture, um, which he created at the end of his life, uh, published in, in Venice. Venice was a very important centre for the publication of books uh, in those days. And it's through this book that his ideas and his plans were uh, disseminated throughout the world. So just to give a few examples of the influence of Palladio, on the top left there you can see Pulteney Bridge in Bath, designed by Robert Adam, after a design by Palladio uh, for an unrealised project for the, the, the Rialto Bridge. So all of uh, Georgian England is really uh, influenced very strongly by Palladio. In fact, the first half of the 18th century, the, the architecture is known as called the Palladian style. And this, of course, influenced Georgian architecture in Australia, not strictly speaking, really a Palladian building, but as a Georgian architecture is strongly influenced by, by Palladio himself. And then at the bottom, we've got Monticello, designed by Thomas Jefferson, who, who was deliberately trying to emulate uh, Palladio uh, with his uh, attached temple front and the, the cupola. It's very similar to the Villa Rotunda. And then a building I'm sure you all recognise on the, the bottom right, the White House, very much a Palladian building. And, and probably one of the, the most recognisable features of the Palladian style in architecture is, is this attached temple front. So it was a style, particularly in the 18th century, which, which really spread all over the world. Here's Palladio in front of his, uh, the Basilica Palladiana in Venice, uh, the, the building that sort of put him on the map. Um, and he was taken up, as I said, by one of the local humanists of Vicenza, uh, a chap named Gian Giorgio Tristino, who was, was one of the leading intellectuals of his day. And just a, a slight sort of diversion onto something of reading around this, that there's some fascinating um, aspects of intellectual life in Vicenza in the 16th century. Uh, Vicenza was a, a, a town with a very distinguished pedigree. It's an old Roman town but it wasn't as powerful or as wealthy as the neighbouring Venice. And it was always coming to grief with its uh, near neighbours in, in the first half of the 16th century. It backed the Holy Roman Empire against Venice in the wars that sort of occurred in the Veneto in the, in the early 16th century and, and was punished for that. And then uh, trying to sort of support Venice against the papacy, it also encountered some conflict. In fact, Vicenza, and I didn't know this till recently, in the 16th century, beginning of the 16th century, was a hotbed of the Lutheran you know, heresy. And, 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 and so it sort of attracted the, uh, the suspicion of, of the church authorities. And in addition to, to these new religious ideas, it was a, a place where local intellectuals and humanists were cultivating the ideas of Plato in their humanist academies. And one of the one of the, the interesting things about all all this intellectual ferment are ideas about free will. So the Lutherans believed Luther believed that humans didn't really have free will. This is just an illusion. Our our striving for the good was caused by the will of God, according to Luther. And it was nothing to do with our individual choices. The Catholics, of course, free will was something that was part of the human condition. In the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve chose freely. To eat the apple and, and thus uh, began the fall of man and the human condition, which includes uh, our choice to behave uh, well or badly uh, according to our personal decisions and our, our personal free will. The Platonists had a slightly more nuanced view of this. The Platonists believed that we were driven by impulses, both good and bad, and it was the duty of the individual to, in some way, educate himself to choose which which path in life to take and, and to control these often uh, sort of wayward impulses. And, and for the Platonists, the path in life incorporated a kind of an education of the soul in which the individual sort of passed through a number of levels, ultimately reaching some kind of understanding of truth, the divine, whatever you want to call it. So all these kind of fascinating ideas um, that were passing around. And one of the interesting facts I found out that there's a theory that Freemasonry began in Vicenza, and they give it a specific year, 1546 now. Historians debate this. I'm, I'm not qualified to say whether that's, whether that's true or not. But there are sort of interesting connections between that platonic idea of passing through different levels and Freemasonry. I'm, I'm not a Freemason, but as I understand it, the um, initiates pass through, through different levels and, and reach high, higher and higher uh, stages of kind of understanding. 
So uh, Trissino is involved with all of these sort of uh, debates, and the, these are kind of part of the, the intellectual climate of the time. Uh, and in fact, he had an academy at his villa in Crickley, and he, that's where he met Palladio, who was working on this uh, building at the time. He recognised the talent of the young man, and he set about making him his protégé. He even gave him a new name. He named him after um, an avenging angel, a sort of a warrior angel in his play, Italy Liberated from the Goths. And this, this angel was called Palladio, meaning the wise one. Uh, and so he got this very sort of uh, grand uh, kind of classical handle from Trissino, who uh, not only educated him, but took him on a number of trips to Rome, where he was able to study the architecture of the ancient world firsthand. And he also... Um, study very closely, Palladio studied very closely, the ideas of Alberti and this idea of harmony of proportion, uh, which is connected to music, which is connected to geometry, and in this kind of Renaissance worldview, which saw all of these things as being connected and ultimately to the, to the sort of the harmony of the cosmos. But, but his drawings of ancient Rome are really, really are marvellous. And Palladio being a practical sort of a chap, as well as, you know, somebody who, who re, re, received this uh, very... Uh, cultivated uh, education from Trissino, made a very careful study of the way in which spaces were interconnected in the Roman buildings. So using these sort of large central halls, you can see particularly in these very careful drawings that he made of Roman baths to connect uh, a series of, of interlocking and, uh, and harmonious, again, spaces, uh, creating a sort of a coherent whole. And uh, so he was really the first of the Renaissance architects to think about planning in this very sort of harmonious, coherent, and yet at the same time practical way. James Ackerman, who uh, wrote a, a, an important book on Palladio, says that there are two kinds of Palladian villas. The first is a sort of an ideal country residence, the kind of uh, building that we read about in people like Alberti or Pliny, a place where the urban elites uh, in, in towns like Vicenza could spend the summer months against a backdrop of civilised nature, sort of restoring their, their, their bodies and cultivating their minds. And the Villa Rotunda, the beautiful, ideal villa that Palladio built later in his career is a good example of this sort of kind of ideal summer residence for, for the elites of the day. The other kind of villa that Palladio built, um, to understand it, we have to think about the city of Venice. This is the, the uh, Palazzo Barbaro and the Grand Canal. In fact, the Venetian headquarters of the Barbaro family who, who built the Villa Barbaro. And we, we need to remember that, that the Venetian nobility basically lived over the shop. So the, the, the residents of the, uh, of the family, the, the domestic spaces are on the first, second and third floors here. And the ground floor, as you might call it, or, or the canal level floor was basically a warehouse and offices. So the, um, the Venetian economy is very much trade-based and work and domesticity were, were contained in the same building of the, of the upper classes. Uh, this all changed in the 16th century with the incursion of the Ottoman Turks, uh, the discovery of America. Uh, Venice started to become marginalised and her economy was threatened. And so the Venetian nobility kind of reinvented themselves as gentlemen farmers. And the Villa Barbaro is a, is a good example of the second type of villa, which is not so much an ideal sort of uh, pleasure palace in the country, but rather a combination of aristocratic dwelling and working farm estate. And we can see that very clearly in the express in the facade of the Villa Barbara. We have that central block with its grand pediment, this sort of, again, the, the temple front facade, and the two side wings which contained uh, the, all, all the equipment and the, the, the rooms necessary for the making of wine, for stables, and, and for keeping uh, various bits and pieces of farm equipment. So, so, so this is the villa we're talking about. Before I get onto that, I'll talk about Veronese here briefly. He's one of the great triumvirate of Venetian painters. You might know this picture. It's in the Louvre, the, the largest picture in the Louvre, in fact, the feast at Cana. Uh, and in the foreground, Veronese has painted uh, portraits of the three great Venetian painters of the day. Veronese himself in white on the left. Uh, I think that's Tintoretto in uh, blue and red in the middle. And... Titian, the great painter on the left, the three presiding geniuses of the golden age of, of Venetian painting, uh, here playing beautiful music together as a, as a string quartet. Veronese imagines them 
uh, creating this this harmony together. And Veronese is famous. Uh, his importance to art history. He's one of the great colorists. And here he's making a, I think, a direct analogy between harmony of color and and harmony of music. Uh, and our two patrons, two brothers, the, the two members of the Barbaro family who commissioned this villa on land which they inherited from on the death of their father, and uh, they employed Palladio to, uh, to design it. And uh, these were, in particular, Daniele, who's on the left, Daniele on the left and Marc Antonio on the right, really most extraordinary characters. Daniele, in particular, is one of the kind of intellectual titans of his age. Uh, they, they were born into a, a noble family, also a family of intellectuals and writers in Venice, uh, and they were, were very much involved in politics and administration of the uh, Venetian state. They were ambassadors and they were intellectuals. Marc Antonio, that's, that's Daniele's portrait by Titian on the left, Marc Antonio on the right, by an unknown painter. Here we see him in the guise of Venetian ambassador to Constantinople, that's the golden horn in the background. Uh, he had the very tricky job of negotiating the uh, peace after the Battle of Lepanto, one of the great sea battles of the era uh, in which the uh, the Ottoman forces were defeated by a, a navy, a coalition of uh, a Catholic forces. Here's, here's Daniele, sli a slightly later date, and he was also an ambassador. He was ambassador to the court of Henry VI in England, uh, and he wrote on a, an astonishingly wide range of subjects. Uh, he wrote about mathematics. He wrote about perspective. He wrote about astronomy. He was considered to be one of the leading astronomers of his day. He was responsible for establishing what, what is uh, one of the world's oldest uh, botanic gardens in Padua, very closely associated with the medical school because of medicinal plants, of course. Very famous garden. And he, he wrote about... Uh, philosophy, he wrote about Aristotle, uh, but his, the work that he considered to be his most important was his translation of the Roman writer Vitruvius's book on architecture, the 10 books on architecture. And Danielis thought that architecture was the greatest of all the arts. And it was, in, for him, it was what, what made sense of, of, of science and art and philosophy. So he held architecture in great esteem. Um, he was a cleric here. He was elected to the position of Patriarch of Aquileia, very high ecclesiastical office, uh, a position he never took up, but it gave him, fortunately for us, it gave him plenty of leisure time to plan buildings and to, and to write books. And he was an enormously important cultural figure in his day. Um, here's a, a detail, again, of his portrait by Veronese, uh, showing um, details of, the, of his work, his translation from Latin into Italian of Vitruvius. Uh, and here's a, a, uh, an engraving from the same work showing an astronomer looking at, it uh, looks like to me, an armillary sphere with the signs of the zodiac on. Of course, astronomy and astrology were the same science in those days. Seems to be a portrait again of, of Daniele himself. He used to make these scientific instruments, apparently. And this is one of the features, in fact, of the, the villa itself. And I think one of the things we need to think about is, um, first of all, before we, we enter the villa, is to think about the sighting of it. I mean, Daniele, being an astronomer and, and one of the great astronomers of his, of his day, apparently, was very aware of the movement of the sun and the uh, and of the planets around the, the in any building or any place, uh, and he would have considered it very important to orient the building according uh, to the stars and the planets. And uh, we can see that the, there are uh, there's a sundial. On the right-hand side, uh, there's a um, an astrolog. Sorry, that's uh, that's the astrological one. I think on the right-hand side, there's a sundial on the other, uh, showing the hours of the day. Uh, and we, we we need to think about how precise the orientation of the building must have been to enable the shadows to fall across these sundials. There's a sundial there on the other side, in the uh, in the in the correct place. So even before the building started, there's this, there's a deep awareness of uh, its place in the cosmos, as it were. The other way in which it relates to the landscape, and here's uh, the book from Palladio's Quattro Libri, the four uh, books on architecture showing the Villa Barbaro. And in the little blurb that he gives above, Palladio spends quite a bit of time talking about the way the villa is situated over a stream. And that stream runs from north, which is at the top of the 
uh, of the image here to south. North is, um, you know, where the, where the hills are. It's, it's in the sort of the foothills of the, uh, of the Alps. Uh, and that's more or less the, the position of the stream. So the direction of that stream sort of defines really the, the main axis of the building. So again, this is very sort of deep connection with the, with the landscape. Stream also had a very practical function. Uh, it flowed from a grotto, uh, this, this beautiful nymphaeum designed by Palladio, uh, down into a pond which contained fish which, which could be eaten, underneath uh, the, the, the building through the kitchens to provide water, and then it flowed in front of the villa into another pond where, it, again, there's another sort of fish pond and also uh, could provide water, of course, for the garden in front of the villa. So it had this very sort of practical function as well as uh, sort of a, a direct connection with the landscape. Marc Antonio Barbaro was uh, also a very fine amateur sculptor. Uh, most of the sculptures in the villa are made by a man named Alessandro Vittoria, who was the leading sculptor in Venice of the day. And uh, uh, Marc Antonio was, was a sort of a pupil of his. And that, that sort of got odd proportions, these two Telamon figures in the grotto, the Nymphaeum at the back, but they, they have a sort of a powerful expressiveness, I think. And there we can see that's the main axis again of the villa, um, which shows us where the, where the stream um, would have run. And so the villa itself, again, placed against the beautiful sort of pale facade, uh, shines out against the dark wood behind it and creates a very, a grand but not overbearing effect. It's not right at the top of the hill, but it, it, it really integrates itself very closely with, with the landscape. And this idea of integration, I think, is the, the key to understanding what this, what this wonderful villa is all about. The uh, facade contains many references to the, uh, to the, to the Barbaro family and th their achievements, their importance. On the left-hand side, we're reminded that uh, Daniele is the patriarch of Aquileia, this, this high uh, ecclesiastical office. And Marco on the other side is ambassador to France at this particular point in time. The double-headed eagle is a reference to Marc Antonio's wife, Justina Giustiniani, allegedly descended from the Emperor Justinian. And there's also, some say, a, a, a sort of a sly pun, Aquila is eagle, so it's Aquileia, it's a bit like eagle. And mythological uh, scenes on the front, that, that shield with the circle is the Barbaro uh, coat of arms there. There's a little, a little sort of barbarian face in there. They call themselves Barbaro. They gave themselves this name because they distinguished themselves against what were considered to be kind of barbarians in the, in the Crusades. Uh, and so that was sort of their claim to family fame, this uh, mil military prowess. So I'd like to take you now inside the villa to the central space, really, the main, the main space of that central block, the main domestic space. Uh, you can see that, again, there's the side wings to left and right, which are the practical part of the villa, and this, this main block which protrudes out uh, to allow light to enter the building. And, and the, the overall first impression is of light, of space, and, and this lovely sort of connection through the painted landscapes to the landscape beyond. And so in the cross-shaped vault, we encounter the um, the first of the uh, sort of the iconographic puzzles that have really tormented art historians over the ages, and this cross-shaped hall incorporates a number of female figures that we see immediately. And um, the, the, neither the Barbaros nor Veronese wrote anything about the the iconographic program, the meanings behind the imagery anything about the, the sort of the, the content of the painting. So it's something that's been pieced together laboriously by art historians over the last 50 years and has included, I think, many sort of uh, dead ends, many, many sort of rather bitter debates. Uh, and I think that, that, that news discoveries are still being made. So it's a kind of a, the whole villa presents itself as a sort of a fascinating conundrum. So here's one of these ladies. There are eight of these women. And initially they were thought to be the muses of Apollo, now, aren't there nine muses, I hear you say, for Apollo? Why are there only eight women? Well, they have to fit into the space. They have to be symmetrical. Uh, and, and so that led to the search for the missing ninth muse. Uh, here they are, these, these suonatrici, they're called, female musicians. Uh, and and we, we here encounter the first of these wonderful juxtapositions in the Villa Barbro, in the, in the painted decoration of these kind of ideal imaginary figures 
um, who, who are like sort of statues and niches, combined with people in the real world, probably portraits of family members, and this wonderful portrait of a little girl who I think Veronese has captured it beautifully, that combination of kind of curiosity and shyness that, that small people so often display when we visit their family. She's sort of peering around the, uh, around the door and slightly cu curious, perhaps, with a, perhaps almost mischievous uh, expression on her face. So it's, it's a really sort of charming detail. And we'll see, as, as you'll see, there, there are many of these family portraits who are not just sort of integrated like a sort of a, um, a rather dreary a painting on a wall or, or a simple likeness, but they interact with us. They emerge from doors. They, they, they elicit our, our responses as we, almost as though we were visiting uh, the villa. So, so these, these people from, you know, 500 years ago pop out of the doors and, and peer down to us from balconies uh, as though they were still living. Uh, and here's her brother also opening a door, well, very, in this case, a very well brought up young man who's on his best behaviour, greeting us as we, as we enter the villa. And so we can see here they are, there are the two images symmetrical side by side. Now, one of the keys to the iconography of the villa, the, the, the way that the frescoes are painted, and it's also beautifully worked out, again, by this extraordinary mind of Daniele Barbaro, the great philosopher, um, sort of proto-scientist um, and, and uh, you know, astronomer and so on. And if you look at it, there's, we're, we're looking down the main axis here. To the left, we see the male half of the villa. To the right, the female half. And the, these two male and female halves, I, I guess, are ultimately we can see as a kind of uh, expressions of, 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 of cosmic principles, uh, yet another sort of attempt to construct an earthly order, which is a reflection of the cosmic order. That's looking in, in the other direction. So these are two more of these, these female figures. A chap named Dennis Ribrio, who uh, has written, I think, a truly brilliant book, and I think he might have had the last word, it's just come out recently, uh, about the iconography of the Villa Barbaro. And he tells us that these eight figures, these eight female figures, are not the muses of Apollo. In any case, where's Apollo? Shouldn't he be there? Where are their attributes, he says. But they are eight women from antiquity known as the Delian Maidens, and they are present at the birth of Apollo and Artemis on the island of Delos, and they're these virtuoso musicians. And, and, the, and the, the birth of Apollo and Artemis to their mother, um, Leto in Greek, Latona in, in, the, uh, in, the Roman, in Roman mythology. And this sort of myth of Latona or Leto is very central to the iconography of the villa, according to Ribrio. In fact, he sees the, the iconography of the cross-shaped hall as um, a representation of, of childbirth, and in particular of the birth of the Barbaro children. And so in, in, this, in this space, he sees a juxtaposition of, the, of childbirth with uh, the military victories of the Barbaro family. So when you come into this villa, you get this sort of subliminal message of the glories of the family. And it's all, all about not only telling you how great the Barbaro are, but... A, a sort of a, there's, there's a kind of a wider message, a wider meaning to it as well. So this idea of male and female, this theme of these, these juxtaposed genders or sexes is um, in, introduced to us in the cross-shaped hall. You can see the flags there in the distance which bear the image of the, of the, of the Barbaro um, coat of arms. And these, all these eight musicians who are, are sort of present at this, at this mythical birth. Uh, and Rubio even proposes that the way that the figures, these children, emerge from the doorways is a kind of symbolic representation of the act of, of childbirth itself. And he even goes on to say that the little mask, if you look at this image here, you look at the very top in the centre there, you can see in that arch there's a kind of a, a, a head uh, where, the, where the keystone should be, and there are two of these. When I was last in the villa, I heard a guide saying very authoritatively, well, actually, that's a portrait, the, the bottom one, I think, there, uh, is a portrait of the architect himself, that's a portrait of Palladio. But according to Ribuio, these are representations, perhaps sculpted by Marc Antonio himself, of childbirth. This is the woman in labour at the top, and this is the, the watchful waiting face of the midwife, midwife below. So we're introduced to one of the main themes of, of the Barbaro Villa. It is, um, it is motherhood, 
it is fertility, it is childbirth. And this is connected again with the wider, wider cosmos, the fertility of the earth, the order of the cosmos. I'll get to that in a minute. One of the wonderful features of the, the villa are these uh, illusionistic landscapes. And look how brilliantly Veronese has painted. It's just You might take a, a minute to just look at this uh, image to see that Veronese has actually painted that image of a landscape, this wonderfully fresh landscape, within an illusionistic kind of lodger or, um, or, or portico. Can you see those two columns in the centre there? They're not actually real columns. They're painted. And that's a flat wall there. And he's um, reinforced that illusion with the insertion of a, a piece of real carved architecture. So that, that beam, that sort of um, entablature that the columns are supporting with those scrolly, swirly sort of motifs on it is actually a real piece of carved sort of stone and, and the rest is, is painted. So it's, it's absolutely brilliant. And, and of course, the science of perspective would be included, wouldn't it? Because uh, Daniele has, has written a book on perspective. It's one of the things that fascinates him, this sort of illusion uh, of perspective. So here's, here's a, an example of one of the landscapes uh, which, which both speak to the landscapes outside and are kind of um, an ideal representation of Italian landscape uh, and its connection to antiquity and the ancient world. And they're, they're some of the first independent landscapes in the history of art, I suppose. That the, in the 16th century, landscape doesn't really properly exist as an independent genre, so they're quite sort of pioneering. But they're full of movement and atmosphere and light. Uh, they're, just, they're just wonderful. We then enter from the cross-shaped hall into the room of the marriage, uh, and here we see a, a representation of the, the Barbaro family and in-laws, as it were, taking on the role of, of the gods of antiquity. On the left is Marc Antonio. He's the married brother. And he's uh, in the guise of the god Hymen, who's the, the god of marriage. The woman on the right, kneeling, is uh, his wife, Justina. And she's presented to him as, as, as a sort of a prospective bride. The, the two figures uh, that flank her are said to be her brothers. They're members of the uh, Justiniani family. One of them re removes her belt. And so this is a, a kind of symbolic representation of both a loss of virginity and fertility. We only need to think uh, the Italian word for belt is cintura, and the word for pregnant is incinta. You take off your belt, your, your kind of circumference is enlarged, as it were, if you're a, if you're a pregnant woman. So, so here is a, is a kind of a, uh, an allegorical or a symbolic representation of not only uh, the, this idea of marriage, but uh, of, of the... Um, the Barbara brother, but, but of marriage in general, the sort of the, the institution in marriage. And they're appropriately showered with confetti and petals by the Cupids. And so just as the Barbara want to show the visit, the, the solidity of this marriage bond, which is the very centre of their family, uh, they want to show that, that to, to sort of look outwards and to show their, their hospitality to their guests. And so we have two, again, references to classical antiquity, uh, these two figures on the left represent the household gods, the so-called Lares, and they're being um, offered a glass of wine by the god Bacchus. And, and this is a very important piece of imagery in the villa because the villa was uh, primarily a wine estate. It was a, it was a vineyard. That's what, they, that's what they did there. So the god Bacchus is very important to them. In fact, they still produce wine there today. You can still buy it. It's a very important wine-producing area. And... Bacchus is, is, is seen to be bringing this sort of gift of civilization in the form of wine to the two travelers who are like the two guests that, that, that are us when we go to the villa. Uh, and we see to the right of him um, a sort of an idealized version of the benefits of wine, creative inspiration in the form of the uh, yet another musician. Some people have liked to think that she's the missing muse who's kind of deserted her colleagues and flown into this fresco by, by accident or design. Uh, but my writer, uh, Ribuio, says that she's a sort of representation of creative inspiration. And sleep is the other effect of wine, perhaps a negative effect. Uh, but sleep is also takes us to the realm of dreams, of prophecy, of wisdom. So, so we see this kind of idealizing representation, not just of wine, but of the, uh, the sort of joys of hospitality and of human interaction. Uh, as, as we welcome, as we're welcomed to the villa, and we've got to remember that these two men are both ambassadors. They've, they've been ambassadors to England, uh, France, and Constantinople. So very sort of high uh, diplomatic-ranking men. 
Uh, here we see the, uh, these two figures associated with the, with the gifts of wine. So enjoy wine in moderation is the message I hope. And here's a, a sample of the, the wines that you can buy, in fact, at the villa today. Uh, uh, this part of Italy, this, uh, we're up sort of near Treviso to the north of Venice is, uh, is of course, Prosecco country. And I think there's even a, a Villa Barbaro Prosecco there. So I want to take you now into the to sort of the main area of the villa, the, the so-called Room of the Olympian Gods. And this is at, the, it's the most important room in, in, the, in the villa because it's at the intersection of, of two axes. And if we look to our left, as we enter the Hall of the Olympian Gods from the cross-shaped room, see this wonderful uh, perspective of rooms. Again, the, the use of perspective, which so fascinated Daniele and, of course, the painter Veronese. And we see a figure, again, stepping through a door to greet us. In this case, um, an elegant young nobleman dressed for the hunt who's just uh, walked in from the fields with his dogs. And so, so again, this is it's real. It's, it's, I mean, and it's a, it's a very uh, sophisticated play between you know, a demonstration of one point perspective in the real world uh, in three dimensions and an illusionistic representation of that at the very end. So uh, a, a quite sort of brilliant piece of planning. This portrait is traditionally thought to be of the painter Veronese himself, but, uh, but later scholarship has, has tended to uh, suggest that it's a, a portrait of the, uh, perhaps of Marcantonio Barbaro, the, the married brother uh, himself. So we don't, we don't really know. And on the other side, if we look again, we've got these sort of two male and female halves to the villa. There's uh, a portrait possibly of his wife, possibly the lady of, his house, of the house. Uh, we don't know. And she, again, uh, stands in a doorway to greet us. So they're on this kind of lateral axis of the building, which, as I said, is divided into these sort of masculine and feminine sides. And if we think about the main axis of the building, which is the axis which corresponds to this stream, we can think of these two axes as the sort of the human axis and the axis corresponding to nature. And where they meet is, as I said, the most uh, significant room in the house, in, in the hierarchy of spaces in the house. And to that, we could add a third axis, couldn't we? It's, the, it's that vertical axis, which I can't obviously show you on a two-dimensional plan. Uh, and that vertical axis leads us up to higher things, the principles, the harmony that governs the universe and the earth. And so we look up to this room of, of the so-called room of the Olympian gods. Lots of stuff going on there at the top and the bottom, and you've got to think that this is above our heads. Feel free to hold your screens up like this and peer up at it. But, uh, uh, you'll have to imagine that the two lunettes at the top and bottom here on the, on the side walls, they represent the seasons. The octagon there contains a sort of a, a circle of the Olympian gods. They're all pretty easy to identify. Uh, and we've got the around that, the four larger figures in the corners there represent the four elements. And the, uh, the grisai, those sort of white figures, represent uh, the, the, the four kind of forces that govern, main forces according to this uh, scheme, that govern the lives of men. And then we've got these wonderful trompe l'oeil representations, of, again, of the Barbaro family to the left and to the right. So it's a slightly closer view of it. And we can see, again, the lady of the house here who, who, who rises up to greet us above from a balcony. And again, this, the, the illusion is fabulous with that, uh, the, the carved stone um, entablature and above that, the, the painted balustrade, which seems to be connected to it. And she's Justina Justiniani. She's the lady of the house. And she's at the very, not at, at the very centre of the most important room of the house. So this is the, these are spaces in which the principle of, of motherhood, maternity, fertility, childbirth, uh, are given centre stage, quite literally. And in fact, she's, she's uh, below an image there, uh, that white image of the, sort of the, the figure with the, the sort of those multiple breasts of um, fertility or fecundity. And wonderful portrait. She's got this rather sort of nice foil to her smooth, alert face, the, the weather-beaten features of the nurse next to her. And she really is, she does present us with this rather regal image of a matriarch. And, and this was a, a, a subject that was dear to the heart of the Barbaro family. In the previous century, uh, the grandfather of the two brothers had written um, a Renaissance bestseller, first appeared in manuscript and only been published 
just a couple of years before this was painted. And it was called De Re Uxoria, on, on, on marriage, on, on things of marriage. Uh, and in this book, Daniele's grandfather gave recommendations for, I, I guess, what was a, a sort of a, a burning issue then as now, what to look for in the ideal wife. And it was, it was e eagerly bought by the nobility of Italy because, of course, the forming of marriage alliances, dynastic alliances, was extremely important, both in, in, in the context of family life and political and economic life as well. Uh, and we can say that Daniele, uh, sorry, Marc Antonio, married extremely well. Uh, Justina came from one of the noble families, one of the great families of Venice, and she also brought with her a very large dowry. So presumably that would have enabled the, uh, the villa to have been built on the scale that it was built. Uh, and on the other side of him, I'm sorry these images aren't fantastic, are uh, the two sons here. And uh, in the centre there, we should, you would think, you, you, according to the, the way the villa and the, the iconography is set up, you should have an image of the husband of Mark Antonio, but instead we see a monkey. Uh, I'm not sure what that's about. Some say that that uh, is a representation of the, um, the, the, the need for the sons to emulate their father just as a, a monkey. Yeah, it will, will, will sort of emulate us. And others say that it's connected with the fact that Marc Antonio was away in France as an ambassador at the time this was painted. So wh wh whatever the reason, it really simply emphasised the fact that the, the image of the, the sort of the, the mother, the matriarch, dominates this space, this most important of all spaces. Uh, and they're a rather nice pair too, the two brothers, the sort of the active and the contemplative, the, the hunter uh, and, and the bookish one. And, uh, and we, we can also connect them to Diana and Apollo in a way. Lots of dogs in the Villa Barbaro. Uh, it's one of the great themes of the Villa Barbaro if you go there. Uh, but back to our room of the Olympian gods. And I've got some, there are some fantastic details there. I mean, Veronese really humanizes his figure marvelously well. You can see that Venus here has confiscated uh, the, the, the toy of her mischievous child. She's taken his arrows away from him. Uh, and Cupid looks imploringly at his mother to, to show that he's been a good boy. Look, he's even attending to his lessons and learning to read. And I'm sure there is some very es esoteric meaning to do with Daniele, Daniele would have intended to do with knowledge and love and, and all sorts of important things, but I'm not sure what that might be. And I love the way that uh, the goddess Diana uh, touches noses with her dogs in this very sort of um, kind of convincing little detail. Um, but back to the, the, the main uh, view of the gods, you can see uh, the Olympian gods circle around this figure in white in the middle, who's very much connected with the image of Justina. She's, she's wearing blue and white. Celeste, the Italians call it, that, that pale blue. And so there's a very much a direct connection between the real wife and this goddess figure in the centre. Uh, and art historians for decades have been arguing about who this goddess might be. Is she the, a figure representing prudence? Is she the escaped muse, that, that sort of muse who strayed from the cross-shaped hall? Is she a figure representing wisdom? The little guidebook I bought there at the villa last year says she's an image of the mother of our saviour, i.e. the Virgin Mary. So I think with symbolism in art, yes, there must have been a specific iconography intended, a specific meaning, a specific identity for all these figures. Daniele was, was that sort of guy. He was an intellectual. But that's not to say that we can't read these symbols on different levels. Having said that, uh, Ribuio comes up with this fantastic theory that she is Leto. She's the, the, this kind of primal goddess who's the mother of Apollo and Diana. And you can see that she gestures with each hand to the, to the gods. So Apollo on the left, Diana on the right. The sun and the moon, she's the mother of the sun and the moon. The dragon that's said represents an eclipse. And so this figure has been interpreted as a kind of a mystical representation of the eternal cycle of light and dark. Later, when she tries to give birth, is prevented by Juno. He, she tries to prevent her from giving birth to the sun and the moon. She normally does it. And then uh, she, she eventually does it. Light comes into the world. Uh, so, so this idea of, of light and dark, the eternal cycles of the seasons, the, the mother of these two She's like a sort of a form of a creation of these, these two primal symbolic gods is at the very center. She, she is sort of the mother of all uh, in, in, her, in her representation. 
and Ribuio sees this as the, the sort of the key to, to all of the iconography of the villa. So that the this representation of a celestial harmony is has as both specific meaning in the context of the Barbaro family uh, and, and a larger meaning in terms of Daniele's world view. Uh, you can see the astrological symbols associated with each figure, which brings us to the question: To what degree does Daniele believe in free will? I mentioned free will earlier. This idea, according to the Lutherans, that that it's 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 God who's acted, sort of acting through us, this divine grace, and we have nothing to do with it really. Or in an astrological system, we don't have uh, any control over what happens to us or who we are. We're simply born under a certain star. And if we think we're acting according to our free will, then that's, that's just an illusion. Um, and we might think that these, all these debates belong to a kind of another era, but they don't really. If you ask a commonsensical person in the street and a neuroscience uh, scientist, do we have free will today? You'll get two very different answers. So I think these questions are alive today. I, I personally find them interesting, uh, as they were 500 years ago. So what does Daniele really believe? Here we see, you know, he's, he's a scientist. He believes in the kind of the, you know, he's, he's referring to the influence of the stars. But he takes, again, this very nuanced, I suppose, slightly Peyton, slightly Aristotelian view. And if we look at his impresa, this is his kind of personal logo. We can see the image of a fire. We can see um, smoke rising up from that fire, and we can see a star. For according to this symbolism, the the, the firewood is the, the kind of human life being consumed. Uh, the smoke is uh, our, our thoughts going upwards, uh, and the star is the, is the sort of the the sort of beacon of truth or some kind of celestial uh, kind of guidepost that, that we should be following. And 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 he he refers to that explicitly in the little verse there he says that it's through our free will that we choose to follow the star it's not that the star is sort of influencing us influencing us without our knowledge or against our will or, or, or sort of tricking us in some way and we move, when we move from the hall of the olympian gods to the uh the two rooms on either side the, the mood changes. And I think Veronese is an artist with a fantastic range. He can be jokey, he can be witty, um, he can be fun, but he can also be quite somber. And, and these figures here, I think, are the most serious in these allegorical scenes uh, in, the, in the villa itself. And so here we see a representation of, rather a different representation of faith, hope and charity. Faith represented by the figure on the right-hand side. Normally it's a woman, but here... It's maybe an idealised representation of Daniele, um, who looks up towards, uh, so, sorry, his hope, looks up towards faith with the chalice, who indicates an image of a dragon swallowing its tail, very sort of esoteric and mystical image, um, which has been interpreted as eternity, or more specifically, it's the endless cycle of time. And that, that, that rainbow-like, the rainbow-like forms are sort of considered to be sort of the layers of the different spheres, the layers of the different heavens. Uh, and that little yellow shape above the little lizard or dragon swallowing its tail, uh, we see that, that sort of the slightly ghostly, luminous image of God the Father, God the Eternal. So the interpretation of this would be of Daniele, who studies the heavens, who studies scientific phenomena, who studies mathematics, not as an alternative to divine knowledge, but as a way to divine knowledge. Um, so faith, charity in the centre there, standing on her riches uh, and hope, who kind of indi indicates this way in, in, Daniel, in Daniela's worldview uh, to the truth. Uh, and this is um, flanked by another representation. These, these are representations of, according to the Renaissance scheme of virtu and fortuna. Virtu meaning freedom, this idea of free will, of seeking out the good, and fortuna being just the stuff that happens. So fortune here on the right-hand side, this, this nude figure prevents the other figure from, from grasping the riches, the cornucopia that there she's got, that she's concealing behind her body. And another figure looks on rather rather enviously, enviously with, with a knife in her hands. So this, this is to say, no matter how we scheme, there are some things in life, 
that we just can't change, some things in the world that we just can't change. So he sort of sets these two ideas of of, of the sort of vagaries of fortune and the, um, the, the the kind of the directed will against each other again in this in this very nice symmetry. So very very kind of lofty and serious themes, but but there's always a, a light hearted. A sort of foil to these things. I think this is. I think this is quite humorous. I don't know how seriously it was meant to. It was intended, but it shows the two brothers here, Apollo and Dionysus. In a way, they're they're kind of in fancy dress or not in fancy dress, as the case is here, uh, reclining sort of in Roman fashion against one of these illusionistic pediments. We see Mark Antonio on the left, who holds a drinking cup, and he's got a sort of a, a bunch of grapes there. So he's he's Dionysus. He's the married brother. He's the um, custodian of the villa, the worldly one. And on the right-hand side, the Apollonian, uh, Daniele, with his lyre, like, like the god Apollo, uh, and the two uh, recline and, and uh, sort of are juxtaposed against each other in this uh, wonderfully, I think, um, balanced kind of view of things. So that's, that's just a little sort of a, a brief introduction to what I think is a fascinating iconography of this of this sort of almost to me um, perfect coming together of a number of great minds the great artist the great architect the, the, the great sort of philosopher and, and and proto-scientist all in harmony with with each other in their thoughts uh, to create an image which is can be described in that one word harmony a harmony between the earthly and the celestial between um, all of the different principles which govern our world, between male and female. It's, it's, it's a, a luminous vision of a perfect world. And the villa, uh, as it sits in the landscape today, with its beautiful fresco decorations, I think remains as a magnificent example of our dream of, what can we say, the good life. Uh, so there we have it. David, that was wonderful. Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> I think we've Thank all you, learned a huge amount. David, was this actually a villa that people lived in? If you go to the Villa Barbro, there are probably dwelt on the sort of the slightly esoteric sides of it a lot, but the imagery is is so sort of teeming with life. There's every kind of dog represented, every sort of species of dog that you could imagine represented, all in, in sort of various sort of doggy um, attitudes. There are children. There are there are landscapes. There are you know family members, and you have to, and and you really get the sense. I mean, it's it's, it's quite a sort of an eerie feeling that this could have been a place that was filled with with servants, with family, with children, with pets. It would have been teeming with life. And I, I don't know if I mentioned that the, you know, the, the first kind of ideal villa of Palladio was really a summer residence. It was a place where you went to have elegant parties or to discuss learned topics with your friends in the summer months and then it was closed up and, and, and empty for most of the year. But this was a villa that would have been lived in all year round and we get that sense, I think, very strongly of the sort of the, the rhythm of the seasons, the passing of time, the fertility of the earth uh, and, all, and all of these sort of kind of timeless principles that uh, would have been sort of so apparent in, in, a, in a villa that was uh, inhabited by, by large numbers of people all, all the time. Thank you, David. And if you have any questions for David, I know he'd be very happy to do his best to answer them. Thank you so much for the lecture, David. As the Barbaro family seem to be people of my own ilk, I'm a descendant <laughs> of the Ruffo and Orsini families myself. Oh, yeah. Anyway, what I wanted to ask you was, the Villa Barbaro has a lot of male-female things because they were people who used to trade in the past, et cetera, et cetera. Did they have knowledge of Eastern philosophies like yin and yang? Is that anything connect, any connection there? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that, but I think that, I mean, I think that a lot of the um, mythology and mythological symbols that they used were really kind of timeless myths that we see across all cultures and, and, and all periods. I I, um, I I don't know specifically that they were involved in um, Eastern traditions or anything like that, but that but I think that idea of the sort of the the cosmic balance of opposites is really something which is universal to all myths, and, and I'm sure if they'd known about the sort of the yin and yang principles, 
then uh, they, they would have wholeheartedly agreed with it. Mm. Thank you. Uh, David, you mentioned at the start um, Palladio's drawings of ancient Rome. Can we yes. see those? They are, I think most of them seem to be held by the Royal Institute of British Architects. Okay. Um, so, so they're somewhere it, in London? Yes, I believe so. I, d I don't know how easy it is to, to view them or whether, whether they're on display or not but they seem to have a large collection, which is, I suppose, to be expected, given that Grand Tour in the 18th century yep. and the fact that the English were so sort of almost obsessed by, by Palladio and, and, his, his, and the Palladian style that they would have eagerly you know, collected and, and sort of uh, bought, bought such things. But um, the one that I showed you was, was quite a good quality image, but I had to really do a lot of searching to find uh, a good quality image online. I'm sure if you went to the, the RIBA and in London and told them that you were, you know, want to see them. They would arrange well, you. Show me. Mm -hmm. Next time I'm passing. And maybe somebody's published them in a book. But Possibly, anyway, yeah. I shall get in touch with them. Yes, yeah. No, um, any other questions for David? David, there was one placed in the chat right towards the end of your presentation. Pam was asking if the images you were showing were frescoes. But yes, I should have mentioned that. They are all fresco paintings. And I think that's part of their appeal. Fresco is, is painted onto a, a white plaster wall. And so unlike oil painting, which becomes a bit darker in time, or if it's painted onto a, a often a dark ground, it, it sort of looks a bit dreary over uh, after a few centuries. Fresco painting seems to retain its brilliance and freshness of colour. I mean, the other aspect of fresco painting is that because it needs to be painted onto wet plaster, or damp plaster, the artist needs to work very quickly. So this means that the, the kind of the execution, the expressive brush strokes, that the sort of rapidity of, and, and the need to simplify things uh, is very important for the art. And, and Veronese does it brilliantly. He's one of these painters of a wonderful facility. So uh, yes, that they are they are all fresco paintings. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, they are remarkably fresh. I mean, that added to the fact that they've got these wonderfully vivid representations of family members from centuries ago makes it brings the whole thing to life it really is a most marvelous place to visit i love the little girl peeping around the door yeah, i thought she was yeah. fabulous <laughs> yes that was absolutely yeah. gorgeous david i was very interested first of all some of the frescoes reminded me of michelangelo to be perfectly honest but yes, yes. um i wanted to ask uh, there was use of prompte in the mm -hmm. villa was Veronese yes. particularly interested in that well, uh, yes, I think that um, Daniele, as I said, the, his patron was, was very interested in perspective. And that's a particularly Venetian thing. And I, I, I mean, I could have put lots of images. I was considering putting in an image of some of the altarpieces pieces by Giovanni Bellini, which really are, are so brilliantly connect the sort of the architectural frame of the picture with the painted architecture within the picture. And so there's that you know, real design on the part of the artist to to bring the viewer into the painting, to really feel that it's not a painting, it's you, you're almost looking through a window. And one of the devices mm. that they use, you know, as I, as I showed you, connecting the the real architecture, the carved sort of ornamental architectural elements with the the painted elements within the, within the painting. So they're, they're really trying to sort of connect you with, with the figures in, in those images. And, but yes, Ooh, very, very nice. beautiful. Brilliant at that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to say a huge thank you for David for taking us mm. right inside the Palazzo Barbaro and giving us such thank a you. wonderful tour of its architecture, its art, its style, its history, the people behind the house. I found it absolutely fascinating. So thank nice. you very much indeed from all of us, David. Thank you. So thank you all so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thanks to ASA for making sure that these wonderful talks happen and that they're free for everyone to enjoy. And, of course, a very special thank you to our wonderful lecturer and artist, David Henderson, who never disappoints. I always love listening to David. So, David, thank you very much indeed from all of us. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have a good evening and uh, see you for the next Travel Tuesday. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.